Well, good morning, folks. Congratulations on waking up this morning. Always a good start to the day. I was walking down a, a side alley in Hong Kong a couple of years ago, and I chanced upon this billboard. Now, I need to tell you that the thinking outside the square is very 20th century. <laughs> Basically, we are moving well towards the 22nd century, and we need to think outside the dodecahedron. Now, for those who are not mathematically inclined, the dodecahedron is a 12-sided polygon. So my contention here is that if you want to create great energy in a community, you need to think differently. You need to think differently to other people, because if you think the same as them, you then have to compete with them on their terms. You must think differently. And here's one of the reasons why. Uh, it's because of my fridge door. <laughs> I'd like to offer to you my theory on fridge doors in terms of life. Uh, like most fridge doors, I'm sure, in this room, they have a whole lot of magnets stuck to them. Uh, and I collect them as I go all over the place. Now, I actually believe that a community needs to become a type of fridge door so it's attractive to other people. So see the magnets as interesting people who also have money who are prepared to come into that community. So I'm going to set some ideas up for you here in terms of creating that fridge door for this local area. And here's one of the reasons you need to do it. Uh, it's because of uh, the way that um, money flows in a community. Now, I hear some people saying, ah, oh, money, it's greed, it's disgusting, and I say, get over it. In fact, I have an expression for this. It goes goimo, G-O-I-M-O. That stands for get over it, move on. Here's why. When I go into rural communities all over the planet, I find that when money is flowing in that community, the community is doing well. It is the abject reality. So we need to find ways of generating that money. So what I'm going to do here is offer to you four brief perspectives in terms of thinking outside the dodecahedron and getting some of that money flowing. Uh, here's the first one. Unleash what they call your locked up assets. As an example, this is a photo of the roof on my house, and you will notice that it has one solar hot water panel, and then there's a lot of empty space. Now, in several parts of the world already, homeowners are renting out their roof space to organisations who want to put their solar panels on there so they can generate uh, power for their various industries. You know, when I look down on most communities, I think to myself of all the wasted assets that are there. So the roofs are just one of them. Another are, in fact, the bedrooms inside them. So you see organisations now like Airbnb uh, who can rent out your rooms for you to people coming from all over the planet. And of course, getting people into a community like that means they're then more likely to spend money there as well. That's another one of the locked up assets. Uh, to me, one of the biggest locked up assets in a community is the IP or what some people call your cognitive capital. If we ever manage to harness all the brain power in one community, we're going to see exciting things happen. So, for example, I'd love to see situations set up where you know, key people in a community are trained in, for example, how to develop apps uh, for the various phones and you know, uh, laptop devices. And firstly, those apps could generate good things in the community anyway to make it easy to live there, but it could also generate good capital that can come in from all over the world. Look for your locked up assets. Uh, it's called eBay to some people. It's where you get rid of all the extra things that you've got. Keep thinking, what are the extra things around here that could actually generate money? Here's my second point. Do some different stuff. Get quirky and different. And I'm talking about in the everyday. Now, for example, I was in a place called Mildura last year. It's down on the South Australian Victorian border, and they were driving me to the airport at the end of the day. And I went past what I'm told is one of the most successful dentistry practices in Australia. So here's the sign. So I had to jump out because I take photos of anything that moves or doesn't. And it's got pain-free dentistry, then in brackets it's got for most people. <laughs> So anyway, I thought, hmm, OK, a bit interesting. So I have a look, and I take the photos, and I look inside the big bay window, and here are the waiting chairs, and even they're shaped like giant teeth. And the lady who was driving me to the airport said, oh, very successful dentistry practice. They do great dentistry, but they always do weird and different things. I love that sort of stuff. You know, when I see a community where people do that in the everyday, I think, there's something going on here. It's a really good energy. I was in San Francisco a couple of years ago. <laughs> And I walk into this corner store, and here's the eggs with this sign on them, boneless chicken dinner. And I said to the guy behind the counter, oh, can I take a photo of that? And he goes, oh, whatever. <laughs> so obviously he didn't do the sign. But I love all those little bits and pieces. So my open challenge to you is start getting quirky and different. 
One of my all-time favourites actually um, occurred for me when I was over in South America about two years ago now, and I get to visit a place called Machu Picchu, which is one of the most beautiful pieces of real estate on the planet. It truly is just glorious. You have to go up there in the early morning and watch the mist coming up on the sides of the mountain. Anyway, when you go up there, you can't stay for a single day. You have to stay overnight in this little place called Aguas Calientes, which is about half an hour away. And I assure you that everything they tell you about South American bus drivers is true. <laughs> I was lucky to live through getting up into those mountains there. Anyway, on this one night, I have to go in and find something to eat. So I go into the local cafe area and I sit down and I order a piece of llama like do as the Romans do, you know, so anyway, I order some llama and I ask for some vegetables and some chips and this young Peruvian guy is serving me and he can't speak any English, I can't speak much Spanish, but I get across to him that that's what I'm after. So anyway, out comes my plate and here's what's on it. <laughs> the llama, which by the way does taste like chicken, uh, and then the veggies and then, the, then some chips, but here's like this little teddy bear sitting there and I'm going, I didn't read about some teddy bear in Peru, you know, what's the scene here? Is it a special custom? So I think maybe you're meant to eat it, so I pick it up and pretend to chew on it. And he's going, oh, no, senor, no. <laughs> so I just presume it's decoration. So anyway, I finish my meal, and he's serving somewhere else, so I put it down beside my feet, and when he comes back, he looks at my empty plate, and he goes, oh, <laughs> like he must have thought I'd eaten it. And I put it back on the plate, and he's going, oh. <laughs> Anyway, later on, I'm talking to the guy who runs the cafe who can speak some English, and he says, oh, he just likes to try some people out. If you look a bit different, he puts that onto your plate just to see your reaction. Now, you might go, what's the big deal? It's just a teddy bear on a plate. Well, I've eaten in probably 20 countries, and no one's ever put a teddy bear on my plate before. So one of my questions to you is, where's the teddy bear in your work? Where's the teddy bear around the local area? What's going to intrigue people when they come in and they go, what the heck is going on here? So focus on the little everyday things, very straightforward. Here's a third one. Take advantage of all the disruptive technologies. This is one of the best ways that you can unleash that dodecahedron thinking. Now disruptive doesn't necessarily mean it's horrendous and awful, it just means it's coming through pretty quickly and if you're really smart about it, you can take advantage of it rather than complaining about it. So one example of a disruptive technology would be what you call 3D printers. Uh, in the past we used to have 2D ones that would print out on a piece of paper, now we have three-dimensional printers that can print out solid objects. They are truly going to make us rethink what we mean by organisations and business. If you make anything that is in terms of like a little trinket or tools, anything that's normally made in a factory can be produced on these in people's own homes. So you can have your car break down and if you know the part that's needed, you could print it out on that and when the mechanic arrives, you could just hand the part straight to him or her. It is going to make us rethink how we live on this planet. And another obvious one is the cell phone or the mobile phone. For at least two reasons, that has massive implications for rural communities. One is that you don't need to be physically somewhere anymore in order to do work. By using these plus other technologies, you can be anywhere. So if someone decides they like living here, they can, and they don't have to be in a capital city to do their work. So there's one for a start. Here's another one with these mobile phones. We are moving from what is called knowledge consumption to knowledge creation. So in ages past, we went into libraries or we found an expert who'd sit and tell us something. Or we watched TV or we read it in papers. It was one way from them to us. Now it's two way and we can interact with it. One of the big things going on in there is the way that people now create new knowledge themselves. So again I, again, I come to the app industry, where you've even got 12-year-olds now who are trying to design applications for these phones so they can make money and spend it on social justice causes and so on. So it's that knowledge creation that's going to get exciting with these technologies. So make sure you tap into that one. And my fourth one in terms of thinking outside the dodecahedron is this. You have to be learners. The change is inevitable. You will hear this from everyone else here today. It is critical that we cope with that change rather than complaining about it. That's 20th century to complain about it. It's just moving on. It's more goimo. Get over it and move on with it. Now, when it comes to this, you need to be a lifelong learner. You are born to learn, you die learning, and you need a whole community who is staying open to all these things. In fact, you need to base yourself on what is called a commonplace book. 
These little books existed back in the 17th century when someone wanted to develop new ideas or they wanted to learn something. So they'd go and sit in coffee shops and they'd jot down notes as people were talking. And they'd go away and they'd piece those bits together and create their new ideas. Charles Darwin was one of the best known proponents of this. And it's generally conjectured that he came up with his theories based upon his commonplace book. So my sense metaphorically, uh, I'm asking, what is the commonplace book that you use where you collate things, you come up with new ideas, and then you distribute them? Because if you have an idea fermentation going on here, you'll never look back. You'll have the oldies, sorry, the chronologically gifted, <laughs> who get together and create online communities. Uh, you'll have school kids who are doing tasks where they analyse why locals aren't spending their money here. And after they've done that, they'll come up with interesting ideas on how to encourage people to do it. It's like a small community in the States where the idea was that they would encourage a 10% policy. So over the next year, they asked the locals to spend 10% more of their money in the local community as compared to elsewhere. And it turned that entire community around. That's what happens when you create a, create a learning community. So if I'm putting all this together, can I drag it right down to this? Uh, all of the things you hear today from me or from others will matter for nothing if you don't have a passion and an enthusiasm for what you do. If anyone is in the way who is like stuck in the 1980s, they need to get out of the way and invite in new people who've got the lifeblood of new ideas. And the key word for me here, the magic word is imagine. It's to actually see the possibilities. In New York Central Park, you will find a little area known as Strawberry Fields, and it's a little area set aside in memory of John Lennon. And in there, you'll find this beautiful mosaic with the word imagine. So I want you to imagine all the possibilities and then get off your butt and put them into action. Thank you. Mm -hmm.